Ready to talk some more Doctor Who uh, for episode 94, for those of you keeping score. And uh, I'm Charles Skaggs, of course. And with me is, in the TARDIS, once again, my partner in time and my partner in crime, everybody's favorite, Jesse Jackson. Hey, Charles. The only thing I can say is at least our break isn't as long as the actual Doctor Who break is having, correct? <laughs> Let's hope not, because exactly. Lord Almighty, uh, yeah, if that was uh, if it was that long, I don't think we would have many listeners. No, I don't think so. So, uh, but we definitely appreciate those listeners that we do have. Um, so, what are we going to talk about? As promised, way back in ye olden times, we're going to talk about the caves of Androzani. Uh, Peter Davison's final story on Doctor Who, and one of my personal favorites, so I'm looking forward to talking about this with you, Jesse, and I hope you enjoyed it. I did, and, you know, I I, I want to talk a little bit, um, you know, this was voted, um, I forgot what year, but the the favorite Doctor Who story of all time, which is yeah. kind of Yeah, I, I think it was back in two, in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think this it, was because it was yeah. part of the Doctor Who magazine poll. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was at the time uh, it was rated. And this is after like the new series had been around for a few years, including yeah. episodes like Blink. And uh, the Caves of Androzani was at the time rated um, the all time favorite. I think currently the last poll that was done, I think it was number three. After uh, Blink and uh, Genesis of the Daleks, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, interesting. But yeah, but uh, so, uh, but yeah, the case of Androzani still ranks very highly. Um, I'd like to think because it has such a, a great climactic fourth episode, and uh, and especially the regeneration. So um, definitely looking forward to talk about this with you. Yes, I am excited uh, too. Uh, especially talking Doctor Who again, because for those who don't know, uh, I was off on vacation for a few weeks. Uh, went to Scotland and London with my wife, Lori, um, and even brought back some Doctor Who goodies for a certain someone I'm talking to right now Ooh. that I need to mail off to you. Well, um, I, I know you posted on Facebook a few photos and made um, some Doctor Who references you know, yes. of scenes from the show and like, oh, hey, I'm waiting. And so um, I, I can I know that's what I would think if I was yeah. there um, now. Yeah, um, if you're following my Instagram feed at Charles Skaggs mm -hmm. or on my Facebook, uh, Charles Skaggs, that, uh, yeah, I posted a bunch of photos where I was actually at the filming locations Mm -hmm. uh, where Doctor Who stories were filmed, including oh Heathrow Airport, like in Time Flight, of course, um, the uh, and, uh, the Trafalgar Square in front of the uh, the National Gallery, where uh, the Eleventh Doctor was lowered in by helicopter in the beginning of the Day of the Doctor, and of course, you know, hey, the Tower of London, which serves as we know as Unit Headquarters these days. Yes. So things of that nature. So if you want to, I'm, I won't run down the whole list, but uh, for the sake of time, but uh, I was in a, quite a number of places. You know, the London Underground, of course, where you know the Second Doctor and um, Jamie and Victoria uh, were fighting against the Yeti. 
And so, so stuff like that, stuff like that. So it was, it was very cool to actually be in those places. Oh, I can imagine. And, and you, you spent some time in Scotland. So were you thinking more Doctor Who or more Outlander when you were there? I think we were thinking more Outlander because Laurie was living out her Outlander fantasy to the, to the hilt. Oh, uh, well, I would be right there with her. That is, that is one of my favorite series. Um, and I think a special place in our heart because it started as Doctor Who fan fiction. Right. <laughs> I mean, essentially, not really, yeah, we, but, you know. Well, kinda. kind of, kind of, because, yeah, yeah. that's that's kind of where Diana Galbadon uh, got her um, I, as inspiration, shall we say, for Outlander because of Jamie McCrimmon, right. uh, the second Doctor's companion. Yes, who is truly um, one of my favorite classic companions. I, I just, I just. I want to see that actor again on Doctor Who, but I, I we're we're getting off task. But it is good to have you back. And then we were supposed to record last weekend, and I was in the middle of my final chemo treatment. Yay, um, final chemo! Yes, yes. The Wednesday after uh, Labor Day, I had my last infusion, and uh, they warned me it would be the worst one, right? Because they're cumulative, and I just just <clears throat> had. Chemo brain is what I call it. I'm just, just I don't feel good. I can't think, and and they weren't kidding about that apparently. No, they weren't. And so uh, Charles was nice enough. He says, "Hey, let's just wait a week. There's no need for you to force through this." So um, I got well, to see the episode. If you go, if time. you wait a couple of weeks for me to come back from vacation, <laughs> least I could do was yeah. uh, give you a week to recover from chemo for crying out loud. Well, that's so, still yeah, very kind of you. So oh, um, you're welcome. Very excited. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking this episode. It is, it is a good one, and there's a lot of things that make it good. And so, uh, why don't we start with your normal Charles Brand <laughs> uh, key points you need to know about the episode before you start asking me questions? Okay, so yeah, some general background on the case of Andrew Zani. Uh, this is written by Robert Holmes, which may be another reason why it's good because he's obviously one of the best writers, if not the best writer, from the classic area. Uh, directed by Graham Harper, who modern fans may remember from such great stories as Army of Ghosts, Doomsday. Uh, the Stolen Earth Journey's End. So he was one of the few directors good enough to be brought back in the modern era. And uh, obviously it was uh, – so he knows how to keep things moving along quite at a brisk pace. And uh, hey Charles, I was going to interrupt yeah. you right away. No. Right. Remind me – and mostly I'm doing this for the listener's sakes um, – what kind of stories did Robert Holmes write? Uh, well, he um, – I want to say the uh, – you know, I'm trying to remember exactly his. Oh, his... I'm sorry. I thought you might have had that ready. <laughs> no, I didn't have it right. I'll edit have... this out right. then. Yeah. That's, that's all right. No, 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 no. That's okay. Uh, I'm trying to remember offhand because uh, he's written so many. Um, because when I saw his name, I immediately yeah. smiled because I know he has a reputation. Um, and just in my limited time doing this, of how many great episodes he wrote. But, uh, yeah, he was obviously one of Doctor Who's greatest writers. And, uh, you know, he's I'm – gonna, I'm gonna, I wish I could – I think, he, you know, he wrote, like, The Deadly Assassin, I believe. And, um, you know, let me pull up his resume here because I don't want to give everybody – I don't want to give everybody hanging. But, uh, okay. Okay. So, all right. So, um, he started off – looks like, you know, he started off writing um, the uh, the Crotons – for the in the second Doctor era, but really he he kind of found his groove in the uh, third Doctor era when he he wrote uh, Terror of the Autons and uh, Carnival Monsters and the Time Warrior, which introduced the Suntarans. Yes, and some other episodes he wrote. Yeah, he did write the Deadly Assassin, so I was right about that. Um, and uh, you know, then let's see what else. Space Pirates. He, yeah, the space pirates, but that's not, that's not exactly a, one of the classics, unfortunately. That's what, and the two doctors he wrote, and he started off writing the ti trial of the time lord, and he, um, unfortunately, like he uh, was suffering from poor health, and right. was not able to finish his. I mean, he wrote most of it, and then it was kind of like slapped together, but uh, but he's got to be obviously uh, he's R got a great resume. The Ribos operation, Ribos oper which is Ribos one of my favorite episodes. Yep, that's, 
That's true. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Um. I. I guess down the road. Uh, oh yeah. Here we go. Pyramids of Mars, which right. is a classic. Absolutely. Uh, the Hand of Fear, The Brain of Morbius, The Talons of Wing Chiang, which is another. So a lot of Tom Baker classics. So uh, I know. Spirit that... from Space, which is obviously one of your favorites. Absolutely. So one of the things that I'm hoping in during this time right now, once we get through our regeneration issues, um, I'd like to watch The Talons of Wing Chiang because I've heard really good things about it. It's a, it's a great uh, story. It's because it basically it's the doctor able to um, be Sherlock Holmes in Victorian London. Oh, nice. With with Leela as his Watson, oh, and nice. uh, and uh, he even wears a deer stalker, which is hilarious. Oh, okay. Uh, so, but uh, mm-hmm. but uh, it's a six parter, so it's a little long. Okay. But it's a great story. Okay. Well, very. So yeah, good. We, that, we would. I would love to cover that one All in right, our off, in our off season. Very good. So so wonderful. I you know and um, truly, I think you know when you talk about you know great writers you know he had a lot to do with setting the tone and a lot of memorable situations to the doctor so uh, this yeah, I, is a very fine episode example of his great work yeah and, I, and peter davison himself considers this his finest story so if you're going to go out on doctor who to go out on your best story is always the greatest and and i do think this was kind of jumping ahead spoilers i think this was a better ending than Tom Baker got. Um, I I would tend to agree with that. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, a lot of fans do too because they kind of rated it as one of the best. Yes. But um, uh, so this is the sixth serial from season twenty-one, not this season finale, because that's actually Colin Baker's first story, the Twin Dilemma. They uh, they were they did a little weird. They actually gave Colin Baker an episode. Uh, before the season ended, or a story before the season ended in 1984. That's unusual, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, especially like, okay, we've most of the season. So it almost feels like um, Davison was kind of robbed a story. But, yeah. the twin, but the twin dilemma of Colin's first story is not very well regarded. Uh, I don't think I'm, I'm causing controversy by saying that. So uh, it was a very odd choice by John producer, executive producer John Nathan Turner. And I think there's some time I'd like to have a discussion, and not this episode, but uh, about Turner and his time as running the Doctor. Because, um, you know, based on some of the the behind-the-scenes stuff I've seen, it looks like they were kind of done with Tom Baker because he had wore out. And then when reading Davison's discussion, he was not as happy with some of the story choices he had in season two. So I'd kind of like your feeling. Maybe we'll talk about that. Put that on the um, how do you to do list the parking the lot as like, you know, we're going to put that on the parking lot to maybe discuss the different showrunners and kind of come up with, you know, your thoughts and the modern era and stuff. So just thoughts. Well, maybe if we use the British term, that would be the car park. So okay, there we go. <laughs> yes. All right, continue, Charles, with your introduction. All right. So I uh, just want to mention a few notable cast members in the story. Uh, John Normington, who plays Morgus, the evil conniving capitalist in this story, uh, he played Trevor Sigma in a, a Sylvester McCoy story, The Happiness Patrol. Uh, David Neal, who plays the president, who Morgus ends up killing by pushing off a balcony. Uh, he's notably, uh, for comic book fans, as uh, one of the Krypton Council elders in Superman the movie in 1978. Ooh, nice. So, little Easter egg there if you're a Superman fan like we are. Um, and he also played the captain of Captain in, of Ming the Merciless's Air Force in the Flash Gordon movie. Okay. So, so if you're a Flash Gordon fan like I am, uh, yes. that's kind of cool. Um and then there's another actor, uh, Maurice Revs, who plays Stotts. Uh, he was a Romulan commander in the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, The Chase. So, very obscure trivia, but uh, but I thought it was interesting nonetheless. You know, I really liked his character. He was very British and very, uh, you know, they did not, you know, we've had episodes in the past where they are set in that, Victorian British era and you know this is but he did have that air about him that um you know kind of uh, a little bit better than normal and um 
and then ended up kind of admiring the doctor. So yeah, I thought that was a really yeah. nice character arc well, for him. Well, he he you know he's um, as the leader of the uh, mercenary group mm-hmm. that uh, you know he's just a he's he's a bit rough. Yeah. Um, and he's not, he's perfectly willing to kill the doctor whenever necessary, yes. but, um, but, uh, yeah, he's, he has this, um, you know, interesting relationship with the fifth doctor in this story. So, uh, looking forward to talking about that with you. Mm-hmm. Um, so without further ado or further ado, don't, uh, let's talk about our first topic. Don't stop me now. I'm having such a good time. All right, so uh, so that's a Queen reference, if okay. in the band Queen, and uh, this is a reference to the Fifth Doctor, who uh, in the story tells Stotts like, "I'm not going to let you stop me now," which is where I got this. So this is uh, the Fifth Doctor's final performance, or well, Peter Davison's final performance on Doctor Who, uh, at least until Time Crash, um, and uh, his relationship with Perry. I want to kind of get into a little bit because obviously he's very concerned about his companion. And that's one of the things that I really love about this story is that he's feels responsible for Perry and he is desperate to save her life and is willing to do anything it takes to save her life. Yes. So let's talk about, you know, a couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to meet Nicola Bryant. Uh, she was yes. at the you lucky dog this, you yeah the second um, Who Fest that it was here in Dallas, and I got to see her and Colin Baker on a panel, and I was able to get her. I had someone do a sketch for her, a sketch of her, and she signed it for my Doctor Who sketchbook. Um, she is a really cool companion. Um, one, she's dressed appropriately. Now she may be showing the girls off a little too much, but I'm never going to complain about that. I, I think she probably would have been better off if she had she worn pants in this story. So well, she did yes. spectrox, spectrox all over her legs. True. But at least, you know, it was, she's not in heels and, right. and, and it is a desert you they know, are planet. So you, you would think, okay, I'm going to wear something. Um, she had a banter with the doctor, but she wasn't totally, uh, you know, like my discussion of the previous companions. I was like, you know, they just seemed to bicker too much. I thought right. this was the right enough, right amount of give and take, giving him a little bit of grief, but at the same time being per, uh, nice. Now, she's supposed but, to be American, right? And so I right. guess people have given her crap about her American accent. Yeah. I didn't have a problem with it. Every um, so often, that little British um, yeah. ac- accent slips in yes. to her American accent. Right. And, and you know, like, it, she, like she says the word gloss. Yes. As opposed to glass. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a little bit posh and it slips through every so often. I, I thought Davison was wonderful as the doctor, had a little bit of sense of humor to him, a couple of good one liners. He seemed to. Um, he was driving the story, um, you know, kind of when they're sitting in the jail cell or whatever, waiting to be executed, he seemed, um, not glib the way maybe Baker would have. Right. He actually seemed a little concerned and, and worried about Perry and talking to her about, Hey, I'm sorry I got you into this. Um, I, I, I just liked the doctor's performance in this episode a lot. So do you think so? Given your previous comments that you weren't as impressed with Peter Davison's Doctor, the Fifth Doctor, in previous stories, how does this story rate? Yeah, I think he was much more likable. I right. think he was more, um, as I do air quotes, doctorish. Right. Where you know he was showing his sense of curiosity. He even makes a glib comment about that. Um, you know he's. He does seem to be smarter than everyone else in the room and kind of, um, yeah, I liked him a lot. I could see why, um, and I'm sure it was an interesting journey. You know, one of the cool things about We Do is you pick and choose episodes for us so we don't see, you know, it's almost like you're 
randomly picking up a chapter, reading a novel, then right. scanning it again, randomly picking a chapter and reading a novel. So you don't always get the flavor because unlike record albums where you it's you know even though an album may have a theme you can pick a song individually and just enjoy it on its own and i enjoy these episodes but i can see the difference of oh i kind of miss the journey of him becoming the full doctor so yeah okay. much liked him a lot and and looking forward to when we go through our more classic watch seeing other stuff he does okay sounds good all right uh yeah um now what did you obviously think of Perry? now now well obviously um, I had watched you know I had watched them in order so I saw Planet of Fire first actually well so no you have too because we did previously watch Planet of Fire right. uh, Perry's introduction so Perry only had two stories with the Fifth Doctor the Planet of Fire and this one so um, but interesting by this time you know, she's really settled into a nice relationship with the Doctor I think. Um, because Peter Davison's doctor is so uh, friendly compared to other doctors, he's you know he's he's kind of dismissed as being the nice one. Well, what's wrong with being nice once in a while? Nothing at all. And um, as a result, um, these two get along rather well. And it's kind of what um, after his regeneration into the sixth doctor, where uh, the sixth doctor and Perry often have antagonistic relationships. Perry says, well, you know, Perry tells the sixth doctor, well, you used to be so nice. Mm -hmm. And so she obviously thinks fondly of him. She's, as you mentioned, she's not afraid to needle him. And, you know, like she calls him a pain and he's just, he has this very great Davison retort of, you know, like I'm not a pain. Yeah. And, and, but which makes him very endearing when, as he says it, but, uh, but Davison uh, I think has finally finally finds his doctor in his final season that he did on Doctor Who here in season twenty one. Uh, he had two seasons where he had his doctor down, but it wasn't like it wasn't. As, I don't know. It just it, it didn't as click as well, and maybe maybe it's just because of the characters and the situations and whatnot. But here in his final season, he really seems like he's found it. So his final season arguably his best performance well and he talked about that in an interview um in um the you know in in one of the dvd extras that he said that if if the first and second season had been more like the third season he probably would have done a fourth season right but you know he, he made the decision before the third season started that he wasn't gonna you know sign an extension um and uh, you know, I get that. And I, you know, and it's kind of after the fact, um, you know, it's supposedly right. The, the, whether it's true or not, the story of Leonard Nimoy at the end of Wrath of Khan filming goes like, man, this was a lot of fun. I can't wait till our next movie. And the guy's like, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> You're like, uh, what? And so, uh yeah so yeah I, I I like I said I like the doctor I like Perry I like their relationship together so um good choice yeah and um obviously once Perry's you know infected with the Spectrox poisoning uh on her legs by falling into the bat's nest yeah or the um there and um she uh she ends up um you know be, the doctor brushes that off of her. So he gets it all over his hands, and as a result, he's infected, and he's infected with something called Spectrox Toxemia. And so the clock is immediately ticking once they find out they're told, oh, hey, you know, Spectrox Toxemia, that's fatal, dude. Uh, as far as we know, there's no known cure, and uh, so you're going to die. And so the doctor is desperate to find a cure because – Obviously, he feels guilty for bringing Perry to this planet and putting her in a situation where she's going to be poisoned and killed. Um, he, I guess he, I'm thinking that he's thinking, well, I could regenerate. Right. But um, but Perry obviously can't. And, and so, so he's, yeah. has this, he has this guilt, and it pushes him so that when like he's uh, taken by Stotts and Krepler, these gunrunners – 
and he's put on a ship away from um, the planet Andrazani Minor. Um, you know, he's like, he's going to be separated by, you know, space that he's like, okay, I got to get out of here. I got to get back because I have to save Perry. And he's yeah. not going to let, and he tells Stotts like, you know, like, you know, and it's this great season three cliffhanger that, you know, he's, he's like, you know, I got her into this, you know, I'm responsible for getting her into this and I'm not going to let you stop me from saving her. And he's very angry and defiant about this. And it's one of, I think, the fifth Doctor's finest moments when he crashes that ship um, to sit, you know, back to Androzani Minor and takes off running as fast as he can to get back to her. Yeah, and they did a good job of kind of, you know, she she falls, he kind of blows it off, you know, oh, I think you'll be fine. And yeah. they keep, you know, all of a sudden she has a rash. Right. You know, and then he has a rash. And, you know, and they... they um, did a great job of building that up, yeah. so that it was it was a slow reveal but a good reveal. Yeah, I thought so. All right, um, anything else about this topic you want to talk about before nope. we move on? No, All right, sir. so let's move on to our second topic: the music of the night. <laughs> I see what Which, you did there. You see what I did there from yes. Phantom of the Opera? A little re- Phantom of the Opera reference. Didn't expect that, did you, kids? Um, so, yeah, little Andrew Lloyd Webber coming at you. Right. Right here in the countdown. Um, so this is talking about, I want to talk about Perry and Shara's Jack, uh, who is, you know, essentially the big bad of the story, but he has some redeeming qualities because he genuinely cares about Perry. And he um, and the doctor kind of find themselves aligned toward the end because they want to save Perry's life. Now, Shara's Jack has a, a, um, a different reason because he wants to keep Perry for himself because, gosh darn it, she's so pretty. And uh, yeah. he likes the pretty things because he's ugly after being scarred by a mud burst thanks to Morgus. And but he's so he's a little unhinged. He's got himself a little Phantom of the Opera mask yes. that he wears. And uh, so there's there's some definite Phantom of the Opera overtones here. And so I want to get your thoughts on that. So at first, when you see someone off screen, let let me rephrase. When I see someone off screen watching what's happening on the video, I go, is this a master episode? And Charles didn't tell me. (laughs) Um, So... I it would seem like very fitting because it was Peter Davison's final story yes, that the master was. would pop up. But we just saw him in Planet of Fire. Right. So that's why I was like, wait a minute. Um, the One of the other things going for this episode is you actually have multiple villains. You have people all playing against different things. Um, you know, I almost think the um, the, you know, millionaire – is just as much a bad guy as you know, uh, Jack, Jack, Jack. Yeah, yeah Sheriff Jack. Jack, Jack. So yeah, J you know, J E K. Yeah, and it truly is. You know, the doctor he talks about this later, where you know I'm just in the middle of this stupid war. You know, I I don't want to be here, and the only reason I'm not just getting in my TARDIS is getting out is because now I've got to save Perry. So yeah, right. I thought. Um, it was not overly played, the Phantom of the Opera, you know, kind of um, hint, but it was um, a little bit of Lex Luthor losing his hair, super, <laughs> our second Superman reference, right, that yeah, kind of obsessed right. him. Right. And, uh, you know, a nice reveal when he takes off the mask and he's all scarred. And right. so I'm like, oh, look, it's Two-Face. It's Man of, you know, Man of the, <laughs> you know, uh, the Phantom Opera. So, yeah, absolutely great. Yeah, um, yeah. Jack, is, in my opinion, is a, is a very interesting and complex villain. Um, you know, he's he has this hatred for Morgus, uh, which is one of the reasons. Like, um, but you know that it's this. Um, you know, the, it's this war that. Yeah, again, that you mentioned that that the Doctor and Perry kind of find themselves in the middle of. Um, you know, where like it's, it's, it's basically a battle over Spectrox 
which is this uh, drug. It's essentially like it's got some. Uh, it's almost like Dune, you know, where we have, you know, the spice melange is like one of the most valued sub substances in the universe. Well, apparently Spectrox is just like that. And so this mining goes on here on Androzani Minor, the only source, kind of like Arrakis on Dune. And so you've got these various factions fighting for control. You've got, um, you know, that uh, you've got Shara's Jack, who's got his androids. Uh, that he's he uses, and um, then you have Morgus, who is this you know billionaire who's um, secretly employing these gun runners to um, supply Jack uh, with weapons to so that he can profit from this conflict because um, Jack is fighting against the authorities. And you've got, you know, you, you basically have all these things going on, and the doctor and Perry are kind of trapped in there with the clock ticking as they're they're trying to get just get away from these guys so they could find an antidote. Yeah. And uh, it obviously complicates the situation. And again, this I think fuels the doctor's guilt because it's like, you know, well, I got you into this, and now I have to do whatever I can to get you out alive. I did not catch the Dune reference, and that's a very insightful reference. Um, you know, we do have the president talking about, do I look 85? You know, and, right. you know, I was starting to feel my age. And so um, that's a really well done because that is kind of this this all, you know, the the quest for this you know, drug that helps you to live longer and be um, healthier and stronger and, and all the quote unquote little people, you know, working to get this, that they don't share the benefit of this. So yeah, nicely said. And, and it does make a great, and I think another reason why this episode works is there is the, while we have the androids and we have the, you know, at the very early, you see the kind of lizard-looking beast. And right. You think, oh, okay, there we've just got a monster of the week episode, but we don't. We have this whole political intrigue and this whole revenge and chapter. It's a very complicated story, um, and not complicated as David Lynch, what the hell's going on complication, but just a very um, – this is a multi-layered story that we're sharing. Yeah. And, uh, not that there's anything wrong with David Lynch. What the hell's going on? Right. That's okay. I, I, I see. I appreciate that. Cause he, yeah, obviously I'm a big, actually I'm a big fan of the movie Dune. I know some yeah. people aren't fans. Uh, I am. I really enjoy Dune a lot. I, I think I it's beautiful. I think it's beautifully shot. Lynch yes. does awesome visuals, and yeah. uh, it's just this really great epic tale. Uh, it's not perfect. I acknowledge that, but uh, but I enjoy it quite a bit. Well, and it's a very comp. It's a very big book. Yeah, and it's a very book of a lot of different layers. And, and it's a it's a great novel by Frank Herbert. Yeah, I, I, I definitely recommend re definitely recommend reading the novel. Yeah, every few years I reread it, and I just enjoy it so much. And Paul's story and how they're going on, and and all the you know fear is the mind killer. And yes, I loved his version of it with all the there's disturbing scenes and and it's just you know it's a great story and so there is that kind of um depth to it and and i i see this totally in this um you know four-parter right um totally agree so um christopher gable the guy who plays sheriff's jack in the story interestingly enough here's a little bit of trivia for you kids uh john nathan turner the executive producer had actually offered the role uh, to Tim Curry, yes, that Tim Curry, um, you know, from um, Rocky Horror Picture Show and all kinds of Muppet Treasure Island, It, you know, the original It, and all kinds of things. Um, and he also offered it to Mick Jagger and David Bowie, believe it or not. Now, obviously, he was looking for some stunt casting here. Bowie, I guess, expressed interest, but apparently wasn't able to because of his touring schedule. And I believe so. We so we all, so yeah. we almost had David Bowie as Sheriff Jack. Now I believe there was a Twitter discussion about this point. 
yes. uh, between you and one of our wonderful listeners. Yes. Um, and you were concerned that this would have taken us out of it, correct? Yeah, I, yeah. I'm not a fan of stunt casting. I think it would have been just more like, oh, you know, it's Peter Davison's final story. You want the emphasis on Peter Davison, in my opinion. And uh, while it would been cool to see David Bowie, I would like to have seen him in a different story uh, rather than this one because I want you know it's Davison send off. He, he deserves the spotlight, in my opinion. Um, and David Bowie being there would have obviously taken away from that. So um, as cool as it would have been, uh, I'm kind of glad it didn't happen. And, uh, you know, just uh, I think it would just would have taken away. Okay. In my Fair opinion. Enough. So um, but uh, it was just one of those uh, missed opportunities. Absolutely. But um, uh, so I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, Jack obviously uh, later confronts Morgus as everything's going to hell in a handbasket because Morgus ends up um, exposed as uh, up to shady no goodness because his assistant throws him under the bus. And so he gets really desperate and starts making really dumb moves. He goes to Androzani Minor uh, looking for uh, this, the Spectrox so he can kind of refinance his operations, uh, but ends up um, at the hands of Jack and pushed under this machine that essentially scrambles his brains pretty good. So that, I thought that was a, and then um, Jack is killed and falls into the arms of his Android version of Salatine, but uh, not before giving um, uh, the doctor some much needed information that the, um, these bats milk, uh, can be used as an antidote. So, uh, and that kind of sets us off and, uh, that kind of leads us into our third topic. I want to talk about, you see what I did there? The nice little segue. Yes. Um, is this death? And this is obviously the, the, the big dramatic build up to the, the fifth doctor's regeneration. And, uh, as the doctor races against the clock, to procure the bat's milk and uh you know again as as all of my androzani minor is erupting in these mud bursts around him so i want to get your thoughts on this very climactic uh ending to the story you know charles you mentioned earlier that maybe one of the reasons why this is a favorite episode is the dramatic ending um it is um well done um, I guess if you wanted to be persnickety, it's a cliche, you know, running at the last minute. But there's a reason why things become cliches, because they work. Right. I, I thought this worked very well. I thought it was dramatic. Um, I thought showing the doctor being so concerned, especially after we had, you know, Tom Baker just falling from, you know, a tower you're right. Like, really? That's that's how yeah. the greatest doctor the time, argument greatest doctor of ever, you know, arguably, you know, that, you know, <laughs> you know, that, that, that that's how he goes out is that that's your your, <laughs> you know, like, you know, so what what a letdown for for Tom Baker fans. I totally agree. But uh, but yeah. here, Davison, I mean. And I, and I credit this to um, the director, Graham Harper, because there's some great sh- – like this normally squeaky clean doctor, he gets all muddied up in this story. You know, he's got mud all over his co- his, his costume and uh, his clothes, and uh, he's down there. He's dragging hard. He's like he's, – he's fighting – like he's being shot at by the gun runners as yeah. he's trying to escape. And later on, you know, he's he's dodging all these mud bursts, and um, you know, as as everything's coming out of the ground to basically try to kill him, he he, you know, using what little energy he has left, he crawls through these uh, little tiny caves, yeah, um, to get the bat's milk. Comes back, and in a great sequence of events, um, he he carries as. As basically everything kind of blows up and sh- shares Jack's lab, uh, his headquarters, he carries Perry off. As the mud bursts are going on around him, 
and you know just he's struggling because he's dying he's he's almost he ready to check yes. out and he's carrying her uh in his arms struggling he finally gets back to the tardis yeah and what does he do he drops the the vial containing the bat's milk but he races down as fast as he can scoops up as much as he can so he saves some of it but as it turns out once he finally gets perry inside the tardis and gets them away just as a mud burst goes off right where the tardis was right um it's only enough for her yeah so again this is the doctor being and and i think this is what defines davison's doctor so much you know like um you know you had the seventh doctor being like the manipulator you had um, David Tennant's doctor being essentially like the hyperactive energizer bunny. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, the ninth doctor was the broody one and whatnot. I think Davison's doctor, instead of being the nice one, I think his doctor is the hero. Yes. I can and, see that. you know, he's the most noble one of them all, I think. And, and that's one of the reasons I like him so much is that um, – Instead of taking the medicine for himself, his first thought is, "Okay, I'm giving this to Perry." Yeah, of course. I'm saving. I'm saving her life. You know, like, uh, you know, I guess I could regenerate. And he, t- you know, he says that as he um, later on, he's he's like, "I might regenerate. I don't know. Feels different this time." And you know, it just it's this great sequence where you know he gives her the bat's milk, and just as she starts to recover. He collapses on the TARDIS floor. And, you know, he talks about how, you know, like, the bat's milk was only enough for you. And Perry's just like, what? You you gave this at the expense of your life? Because she doesn't know he's going to regenerate. She's never seen regeneration before. No, she hasn't. So, um, so what did you think about this whole sequence before yeah. I go further? No, no, I, I totally agree with you. You know, it's almost like... Um... And if I was a better history historian of Arthur King Arthur legends, Arthurian I, literature, yeah, yeah, I could probably tell you, you know, each of the, it's probably it would be an interesting discussion which of the knights of the Round Table represent the different doctors, but Davison does remind me of Lancelot, you know, the the right. noble, just you know, truly trying to do the right thing, um, and. You have no doubt that this is what the doctor should do and will do, right? Um, and it it and you do wonder. I, I love that we play the regeneration as we've continued through this journey. That it is not something. It is not just changing clothes. It is a right. painful transition. It right. is not something someone wants to go through, i.e. chemo, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah it, exactly. it is. It is something that you have to do and you're glad to do because, you know, you, you want to continue living and, and your next version of the doctor will be different. But it is not something just a matter of, you know, I'm going to just change T-shirts and move on. Right. So I, I love his sacrifice. I love the um, sincerity of his sacrifice and also the urgency he feels, this this I have to protect my companion because right. all of this is my fault. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and then you know, just it's it it's it's so powerful, especially especially when I'm watching this the first time, because Davison, remember when I was watching this the first time, uh, back in the eighties. You know, like Davison, I consider my doctor because I got to watch his doctor from the beginning. Right. So here I'm watching this, you know, this finale. And it's just it struck me as just so um, tragic in a way, (laughs) but but epic as well. Yeah. Now, at this time, Charles, um, back before the Internet, were you aware that this was going to be his final episode? Uh, I was aware enough because I had a listing of Doctor Who stories. Okay. So I knew this was his final story, but I didn't know what was going to happen. Okay. Okay. Like, we didn't have Wikipedia back in the olden days. No, we did not. Okay. So, so at the time, um, all I had was, like, I, I used to subscribe to a, a publication called Comics Buyer's Guide. Right. 
Um, if you're a comic book fan, you old school comic book fan, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, we do. And because back, yeah, but you didn't have the internet, so you only got comics news really from the Comics Buyer's Guide. Maggie. Maggie Thompson. Yep. And and Don Thompson, her yep. late husband. So, um, so yeah, it's just it was one of those things that uh, if you're a comic book fan and you're a serious comic book fan, you subscribe to this newspaper. You got it we once did. a week. Yep. And uh, it was great. So Boy, and they, if you got they, a letter published in that. I, I did got to a couple of times. I, was I got so, a, I felt so proud. Yep. I got a couple of letters published myself <laughs> yeah. and I uh, had uh, Peter David actually published one of my um, things for uh, uh, in his, but I digress column oh, that's of this, cool. mis- this mystery Sandman theater 3000 thing he was doing Yes, where he, he mashed up, wanted to mash up um, Neil Gaiman's Sandman with mystery science theater 3000. Yeah. And he asked for uh, examples of how to do that, and I did that, and it got published. So that was very cool. That's awesome. Um, but I digress, appropriately enough. So um, so anyway, so Comic Spire's Guide had a listing of all the Doctor Who stories through, I want to say, Colin Baker's like first season, full okay. season on Doctor Who. So um, they published that list. It's just you know like okay. Here's here they are in order under each doctor. So I clipped that list out of the paper and I saved it. And um, that's what I used to kind of follow along about what the order was. Because you're watching this on PBS. I'm watching this on PBS. So, so yeah. it's a delay. How long right. a delay was it normally from when it went to England, when BBC showed it and when the PBS showed it? I think from the original airing, I think it was about – Two three years okay. delay from the original BBC airing. Okay. So so yeah so that was my only way because you know TV Guide wouldn't list them. No. And you know whatnot. So. And you uh, know back again, I. It's such a different world, and I know we're yeah. sounding like old people. Yeah, we are. We're like like well, well here we back are. Back in the day. Yeah. Uh, but you know you didn't you didn't get news from England. Yeah. You know, no American. I mean, that's why I still smile when Entertainment Weekly puts a Doctor Who image on its cover. Yeah. Or in it covers this. It's a big it's a big deal for me to see Doctor yeah. Who on Entertainment Weekly. Yeah, it is because there there was no way of you knowing. Yeah. I mean, exactly. you may have heard a rumor that, you know, there well, because you've read this, okay, well, Colin Baker is now the doctor, but you know, that's that's just to give our listeners who are young an understanding of what kind of world we were living yes. in back then. Yeah. So as, as friend of the show, Ken Schaefer, he liked one of my quotes about this, you know, where I said, uh, we didn't have the internet. We played with rocks and sticks. Absolutely. <laughs> so Ken, Ken actually made a point of telling me how much he enjoyed that line. So that's, Absolutely. that's for you, Ken. Yes. All right. So, um, so here we are. Uh, the doctor is about to regenerate and he collapses to the floor Perry comes over to kind of cradle him in her arms. And uh, there's a very, I know this is, I know where you're thinking because you got this big smile on your face. <laughs> well, because so, Davison so, talked about that, right? Yeah, that he was yeah. a little upstaged by the girls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so obviously Perry, so Nicole Bryant, all right, she has ample cleavage. So yes. let's, let's, let's try and be adults about this a little bit. <laughs> we do have female listeners here. Yes, this we is, do. This I'm is, not complaining. I'm just this saying, is, yes. This is not the voice club. Here. That was, I was not, sta- I was not staring at that. I was focused on him and yeah. the performance. It was, yeah. I, I thought very, he he did a very good send off and a very right. touching ending, and um, yeah, he talks about you know like it's time to say goodbye. Yes, and then his final words to Perry are like I, I might regenerate. I don't know. Feels different this time. So right. already you're, he's setting the table like you don't know what's about to happen really. Yeah. So we get this started. We kind of get this um, the image of uh, the Doctor's previous companions uh, kind of swirling around. Um, you know, like we, we, we first do, um, we see like um, Tegan, you know, telling him Braveheart, which was her kind of like catchphrase or the Doctor's catchphrase for her where you would tell her Braveheart. Um, Turlo shows up. Uh, Chameleon, who you haven't seen yet, 
Um, he's only in two stories. Playing the well, actually, no, you did see him in Planet of Fire. I take that back. So you saw Chameleon. Uh, Nessa shows up, and then finally Adric. And Adric, it's actually um, the Doctor calls out. He says Adric. So that's actually the Fifth Doctor's final word is Adric. And I think a lot of that comes from the guilt that he feels over Adric's death. Yes. So it was interesting to save him for last of the companions, but Adric tells him to live, encourages him. And then all of a sudden we see the master, uh, the third master, Anthony Ainley's master, who instead is laughing at him, saying, telling him to die. Die, doctor, die. Yes. And apparently this is what pushes him through that regeneration. Right. Because he knows that he has to fight the master. Yes. So, um, so all these things swirl around in this, and then there's this like big, like uh, CGI kind of um, build, and a boom, and then all of a sudden, Colin Baker wakes up in Davison's clothes, obviously. So the sixth Doctor is here, and uh, Perry is just speechless at this, uh, you know, doing the I I I, and right. then, you know, just. Um, uh, Colin Baker retorts, you know, like, you know, three eyes and one breath makes you sound like a rather egotistical young lady. And uh, she you know, says, uh, you know, what's happened? And he goes, change, my dear. And it seems not a moment too soon. Which um, I love the fact that when um, the new doctor was announced, Colin tweeted that line. Yeah. Uh and I just uh, when Jody was announced, I just thought that was so perfect yeah. that yeah. he did that. Um, we yeah, it's very to... it's very it's very fitting for yeah to yeah. because yeah it is change. It is, and, and unfortunately, some people have problems with change. Absolutely. Um, we will talk about this as we move forward. Um, I I think. Um, so what, soft, did, so what did so what did, yeah. what did you think about this regeneration? First I, off? I thought it was really well done. I, I I love when, like I didn't have a problem with David Tennant's, um, you know, victory lap where he saw all these old, you know, we saw all the right. people that had been involved in his system, and even though that's the world's longest regeneration cycle, uh, I, I yeah, the fair the farewell yeah, tour. tour. I, I that doesn't bother me because I think. You know, they talk about, you know, supposedly your life passes in front of you. Right. Um, and I like that idea that the doctor does think back of his companions and, and his adventures and and is kind of a um, this almost melancholy, you know, bittersweet uh, change. So I liked it. I thought it was very powerful. Um, now, where, where, where would you rank it among the regenerations? I know mm-hmm. I rank it as my favorite regeneration that because of that whole build up, the dramatic build up, and then the regeneration. And I th- and then I, and do you agree with me that this was the, mo- the doctor's most heroic regeneration? Hmm. You know, I love Tennant. Yeah, I love that Tennant died for Wilford. Right. So. It. I'd have to think on that, Charles. Okay. And I do think this is possibly... But it's up there. Yeah, yeah it is definitely up there. And, and I also think it could be, you know, I love tenants. I don't want to go. Yeah. You know, that line and that, that sadness in there. So See, see I, th- I think it... I, see, to me, that comes off as petulant. Oh. Yeah. You know, because it's it, he's not very self-sacrificing. He's kind of like... And he puts off the regeneration as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, um, he's because I, he doesn't want to go. He's being selfish. He wants to stay alive, but uh, but I think Davison, that's good Davison, for another is, discussion. Yeah, I think Davison would have been. Um, I don't know, and but see, I also think there's a personal bias of both of us. Is right. Tennant's my doctor, and yeah, I, Davison I, I is agree. your doctor. Yeah, I so, I, I, but I that. certainly agree. Um, I, I, I'm. We haven't seen Capaldi's yet. Right. Um. I'm hopeful. Uh, yeah. Um, I think Matt Smith's was okay. Yeah, I would um, agree. It, yeah, it's okay. You know, and Eccleston, Eccleston had a, a decent exit. Yeah, it but, did. But, uh, but, I, but, I, but I feel Davison's is more powerful. Yeah, I, right now, as I'm trying to go through them, I, I think um, Brady or Montana. 
Yeah. I think Davison and Tennant uh, are the in the discussion of, I think, the best. Okay. So is that fair enough? That's totally fair. Okay. I think that's, that's a perfectly diplomatic way to handle it. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Because I do think, you know, when I think of the rest, because um, I know on some of the others we don't see. Like, um, you know. Well, we, we saw basically, basically Hartnell, Hartnell's doctor, the first doctor, checks out because of it. His body wears out. Right. Uh, the second doctor, his he's forced to regenerate. Right. By the Time Lords. The third doctor, he comes back after being doused with radiation poisoning. Right. Uh, finally finds his way home and dies. The fourth doctor we talked about. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't very heroic at all. Uh, yeah. Although he kind of, well, it kind of is, but. You know, yeah, he, I know. It's he kind of lets down. himself go. Yeah, it's a letdown. Yeah. Um, and the sixth doctor. Now, the sixth doctor, televised wise, it's it's explained that he hit his head on the side of the TARDIS console, right. which is the least heroic ever. Yes. But in another story, the audio adventure story, The Brink of Death, he gets a much better ending. And that's one thing that I want to talk about. Okay. So kind of set up our next All right. episode in 95. So but, uh, the McCoys so, in the, yeah, the movie... McCoys, I yeah, didn't think it was anything. In fact, I thought it was a little anticlimactic. That he, yeah, he walks out of the TARDIS, gets shot, and then yeah. dies on the operating table because Grace can't figure out his physiognomy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think the definitely eighth, the, eighth, the eighth Doctor checks out as we found out in the night of the Doctor, because he was he had crashed on that planet and is fatally injured. Now that's a pretty good regeneration. I hadn't thought about the eighth. Yeah. So I, I would but, think, but he essentially decides, okay, I'm going to become a warrior, right? And takes the um, that elixir of life right. from um, the uh, the um, priestesses, the Sisterhood of Karn. Yeah. So that would probably be number three on my list. Okay. You liked you liked the uh, eighth regeneration. Well, and I'm just, and also, um, yeah, I did because it was so uns, it was so surprising to us. And the War you Doctor know, essentially also wears out. Yeah, and he's like, of course, I'm not needed anymore. Yeah, um, like his body's wearing a bit thin, yeah. just like uh, echoing the first Doctor. Yeah, so I think if we go um, Davison, Tennant, and um, why am I drawing McGann, a blank? McGann, yeah, Paul McGann. McGann, um, and I would be okay with those three orders. Okay, so, All right. fair enough. Good all job. right. All right. Uh, anything that else about nice the I had not planned on that. That was a nice little discussion. Well done, you like Charles. That? You like that? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anything else about this uh, sequence that you want to talk about? Nope. Nope. I'm good. Okay. Um, before we move on, I just want to give a couple of little uh, uh, little points that we didn't talk about. Uh, in this story, we finally find out why Peter Davison's doctor has a stick of celery in his lapel. Yes, yeah. we do. Yeah, so um, you know, he obviously put it on in Castrovalu, which we talked about in the previous episode of Next Stop Everywhere. But uh, here we find out that his doctor was allergic to certain gases in the Praxis range, which would apparently turn the celery purple if the gas is present. And then the doctor would then eat the celery because, if nothing else, it's good for his teeth. Yes. And uh, And apparently... The real reason for this was that Peter Davison requested that there was an explanation for the celery, and uh, the script editor Eric Sward worked it into the final script. Yes, yeah. I read that as well. It's a little trivia bit. Yes. yes. And then um, if you're an 11th Doctor fan, you probably find the name Androzani a little familiar because Androzani Major, not Minor, Major was referenced in the t 2011 Christmas special, The Doctor, the Widow, and the Wardrobe, as the homeworld of the expedition members who came uh, to the world, winter world, to harvest the Androzani trees. Yes. A little little tivi trivia bit there. So I just thought I'd mention those, since it didn't come up in this discussion. No. Um, the, another thing I wanted to mention, and I... Uh, the... Assistant Timon Barbara Kinghorn looked familiar, yeah. but I there is nothing on our IMDb IMDb page yeah. that would tell me why. But um, I, I you know, in she just very, had that kind of that that familiar tone to her. She did, and so I liked her. So okay, yeah, and she was it, was. it was nice that you know she's very quiet throughout most of the story, and then all of a sudden she flips on 
Morgus. Yes. And uh, Tully throws him under the bus, which I kind of love. Yeah, I did too. All right. Uh, and if, I love throwing the president out the window. Was another yeah. scene that we didn't talk about <laughs> that I kind of liked. Like, poop. Yep. <laughs> yep. He's dead. So I thought that was good. Uh, anything else about the story before we move on? No, no. Uh, a great episode. I understand why people voted it so high. Um, I think it has high rewatchability yep. because of the complexity of the story. So, um, yeah, good job. Okay. All right. So do you have any favorite quotes from this story? I do have a few quotes. Um, so I um, – the obvious one is I tried keeping a diary once, not chronological, of course, but the trouble with time travel is one never seems to find the time. Which is a very doctor line. I like a that. Very doctor line. Yeah. Um, so uh, another uh, exchange that I enjoyed uh, was between the doctor and Stotts, of course, at the end of episode three, uh, where Stott says, you better turn the ship around, doctor. The doctor replies, why? Stott says, because I'll kill you if you don't. Well, obviously. Um, so the doctor responds, not a very convincing argument, actually, Stotts, because I'm going to die soon anyway. Unless, of course, I can find the antidote. I owe it to my young friend to try it because I got her into this. So you see, I'm not going to let you stop me now. Very nice. Love that. Uh, Jack saying, your sense of humor will be the death of you, doctor, probably quite soon. Um, as we love quips, I thought that was really well done. Yeah, that was good. So, uh, yeah, and, uh, the only other line that I had, I kind of spoiled it. My my own line was, uh, you know, you were expecting someone else. I, 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 that's three eyes and one breath. Make you sound like a rather egotistical young lady. Uh, I love curiosity has always been my downfall. Yep. And um, another great, I thought you might mention this one when you talked about exchange, when uh, Jack says, the sight of beauty is so important to me, and the stimulus of a mind nearly equal to my own. And the fifth doctor says, thank you. And then he <laughs> says, Jack says, I've missed so much of life these last lonely years, but your arrival has changed all that. We shall become the best of companions. No pun intended. Right. Um, and the fifth doctor says, what do you say, Perry? We could go on nature walks, have picnics, jolly evenings around the campfire. And Jack says, don't mock me, doctor. So I, I, I just love that. Dear, I just love that back and forth. Yeah. And Jack, Sheriff's Jack is obviously a very theatrical villain. So, yeah, yeah he delivers that. Yeah, just over, a kind of over the top, but it's a good over the top, yeah. in my opinion. And then the uh, last one, though yeah. there was a lot of stuff, is I'm not acting for anyone. I was just passing through. I happen to get mixed up in this pathetic little local war. Nice. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of good lines in this. Yes, Robert Holmes. Is. Robert Holmes obviously turns in another killer script. He's bringing it. Yep. So he's again. You can see why he's one of my favorite writers from Absolutely. classic Doctor Who. All right. Uh, rating. What's your rating of this story? So you kind of spoiled this, but I'm going to give it nine stalks of purple celery. Nice. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Um, and how about you, Charles? Uh, obviously, I kind of tipped my hand. 10 out of 10, dropped vials of bat's milk. Nice. Very but, good. Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a home run for me, Yeah. this story. One of the few home runs of Doctor Who, this is a home run for me. Yeah, and so, I do think and it, as re-watching it. it, I'll enjoy it more. I, I do yeah. think this is one that I will end up re-watching. It ages like surprisingly it. well because yes. yeah, I've I've been watching this since the '80s, obviously, and yeah. uh, this one kind of holds up pretty well. I mean, the only real down part is that monster yeah. in the caves, but thankfully they made like I think they knew it looked silly, so they didn't show it much. No. Like, it's not there very long before no. it gets killed, and so thankfully they got that out of the way. Good. And so it's not a big deal. So right. it's not a deal breaker in my opinion. Very cool. All right. So do we have a reverse the reverse the polarity segment? Damn it. I forgot. You did? I did. I, I totally forgot. I was so worried about rewatching the episode. Um, oh, that's okay. okay. I have, you have one. one? I, okay. Thank you, Charles. Thank I have you for one. Carrying me out. Because yes. I got your back, buddy. Thank you, buddy. All right. So, uh, so. I'm going to reverse the reverse the polarity back to 2008. Um, I was going to let you have this one, but I, you probably already thought about this one. Uh, to the doctor's daughter, 
the sixth episode of series four in 2008, written by Stephen Greenhorn. And uh, you can probably figure out why, because uh, continuing the where the Poison Sky left off, if you remember, the with the Suntarans, uh, the 10th uh, Doctor, Martha, and Donna go to the planet Messaline. And as they emerge from the TARDIS, they're met by soldiers working for General Cobb. And the soldiers force the Doctor to stick his hand in a progenation machine, which uses his DNA to generate the female soldier, Jenny, who becomes the Doctor's daughter. And of course, Jenny is played by none other than Georgia Moffat, and now Georgia Tennant, a.k.a. Peter Davison's daughter. Yes. So what better fitting story, in my opinion? Oh, Uh, I would not have picked that, but that is perfect. Yeah, uh, but 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 yeah. So yeah, they're essentially they to boil this down to a, a really simple story that uh, they end up in in this conflict, this war, just like in Caves of Androzani, um, where they're kind of trapped between these sides, and uh, they're kind of trapped, and uh, they have to kind of navigate through this war to uh, keep themselves alive. And then at the end, of course, um, uh, Jenny dies, just kind of like the Doctor, but she regenerates, just like the Fifth Doctor. And then she ends up stealing a rocket and leaving the planet to have her own adventures. So you do get kind of a regeneration in this story as well. Yeah, we so want to see her back on the screen. I, I know they're yeah. talking about doing big finish audio yeah. adventures with her, but I, I'd love to see her back on uh, The Doctor. I don't think we will with the yeah. new showrunner um, because I, I don't know if he'll want to go back to that recent history, but it right. would have been great to see her again. Well, I will point out that if you're a fan of the um, comic books, Doctor Who Comics by Titan Comics, right now Jenny is featured in this big crossover story called The Lost Dimension. Oh, okay. And um, it's a it's a storyline that crosses over between uh, the Ninth Doctor, the Tenth Doctor, Eleventh Doctor, and the Twelfth Doctor, running through all their titles. And uh, Jenny has a very prominent role in this story. I will go pick so that if, up. So if you're looking for, for more of Jenny, um, hopefully Big Finish, yeah, we'll do some Jenny audios at some point. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I definitely recommend checking those out because it's actually a pretty decent story so far. It, it's only in like part three of eight right now, so uh, okay. now would be a good time to to check it out at the local comic book store. Very nice, and support your local comic book store in the process. Absolutely. All right, so uh, so I hope you like that pick. I did. Yeah, um, I've got I've got in the habit of like doing these little backups in case. Uh, yes. You've... No, I I I had I totally <laughs> now I have an ending quote. But yeah. I just I totally forgot that. Um, I'm gonna blame it on the chemo. Uh, there you if, go. If if I can pull you just for a moment um yeah. so while you were off exploring the world uh labor yeah. day weekend i went to dragon con in atlanta which was uh, awesome it was awesome i'm and so jealous i'm so jealous it was um i participated in a class panel on yeah. the british track and how'd uh, that go that went well it was funny because um everyone was going through their kind of class and what they thought about it. And I was, uh, I said that I was the two grumpy old men on the Muppet show because I did not enjoy class. Right. Um, and the more we talked about it, it was a pretty good, it was, uh, was everybody depressed that the show hadn't been picked up for season two? You know, they had not announced it yet when this happened. And later, you know, after Labor Day, we found out it's officially canceled. Um, the more we talked, the more people recognized the flaws in the show. Right. And it did it ended up being Charles it felt like a class anonymous group session <laughs> about uh, you know that the more you talked you realized that people wanted to like it because it's the Doctor Who universe and they want to see more Doctor Who and they you yeah. know just almost this sense of loyalty like um almost like the first Star Trek movie. Yeah. You know, you're like, okay, don't say anything bad about it, you know, because we want more movies. Um, <laughs> so I would be like, you know, like, like going there. If I was there, I would be like, you know, hi, my name is Charles. Hi, Charles. Yeah. And I watch class. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, 
and so I did mention uh, our podcast. Uh, I mentioned our podcast in a lot of different panels. Um, but um, everyone, it was a very good discussion about and how they wanted more things. They talked about that yes. we, we focused on the good stuff and the bad stuff. Um, and the other thing I wanted to share is um, I had my Doctor Who sketchbook, and I ended up getting two new sketches. I posted them both on my Facebook page, but yep. one of them was amazing. This uh, artist, um, I went to him. I said, hey, are you a Doctor Who fan? He goes, absolutely. Uh, um, I said, would you do a sketch? He goes, yes. He said, what do you want? And I said, dealer's choice. It's truly the artist. And he says, okay. And so he started looking, and he says, okay, I have an idea. All right, so I went back to Tom, friend of the show, designer of our artwork. Yeah, um, you know, Zoller's of our show, of our show logo. Yeah. Yes, and he came back about an hour or so later, and he said, "You did not have a sketch of the first Doctor," and he did a wonderful sketch of the first Doctor in my book. It was very and, cool. Yeah, um, and so that was really good. And then another guy did a lady did a tenant version that was almost kind of pixie like you know it was okay. a very different yeah. look so it was very nice so but i was especially happy with the first doctor being represented it was a really beautiful sketch so um Good. i'll probably i'll send that out um it's on my facebook page and i think you retweeted it i'm pretty doctor sure i did yeah yeah but uh, yeah. definitely check it out yes it's so awesome it's, it's awesome stuff. artwork absolutely right. okay right. um before we move on we do have some feedback um uh, yes. that's been that's been sitting around a few weeks waiting for us uh, to record this episode. So um, obviously we have our standbys, Holly from Wisconsin and Paul from Australia. Yay. So um, thanks to both of you for writing in, as always. Uh, so Holly writes in about Caves of Androzani. Hey, guys, I forgot how much I enjoyed the pairing of Perry and the Fifth Doctor. Yeah, they are pretty good together, aren't they? I agree. Uh, would love to have seen more. Uh, it's been a while since I've watched Caves of Androzani, and it's just as good as the second time around, if not better, because I have more classic Who and new Who under my belt. Well said. Uh, well said. I uh, was chuckling at the Doctor's advice when uh, Perry commented that what she slid in into was stinging her well don't fall easier <laughs> si easier said than done yes. doctor and uh i guess um let's see uh oh was it here the um uh Shares jack was an interesting villain and at times you don't know who's pulling the strings uh the most and who has the most power and who's the most dangerous between the two of them uh i think she's probably talking about morgus too um but uh, Spectrox equals Fountain of Youth and Money, but with a name like that, it sounds a bit pesticide or weed killer. <laughs> nice. Uh, the execution of the Doctor, execution scene of the Doctor and Perry, you know, when they were wearing the red cloaks. We didn't really yes. talk about that. Uh, kind of reminded me of the bit of the scene in Flash Gordon, where Flash Gordon gets executed, in air quotes, uh, but still survives. Thanks, thank heavens for androids. I uh, really feel the danger between that or that Perry and the doctor are in uh, when they find out next to how next to impossible it is to get the antidote to Spectrox toxemia, the cat and mouse game and trying to figure out for sure if Jack and Trow, I think maybe that's the, uh, are actually working with one another or against each other uh, has me scratching my head slightly, but paying attention nonetheless. Trow killing off the president. I think she means Morgus. Um, so Morgus killing off the president and taking over the and negotiating with Jack, how convenient. Uh, the doctor unsupervised in a space vehicle that isn't the TARDIS. This is going to get interesting in a hurry, and didn't it? Yeah. Uh, gotta admire the doctor wanting to self or sacrifice himself to make sure that Perry gets the antidote. Exactly. Gotta admire that. Uh, the doctor is incredibly lucky. Stotz's men uh, have horrible aim with their guns. And I forgot the twist at the end with uh, Timmons. Morgus got what he deserved. And then she wraps up uh, the doctor's regeneration scene with his companions. And the master was interesting. And I can see why it may have affected the sixth doctor um, as a result. So I'll wrap it up here. Holly from Wisconsin. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Holly. Uh, that was very cool feedback. Um, and, uh, Paul from Australia writes in, Hi, Charles and Jesse. i got to say right from the start that this is one of my favorite episodes of Doctor Who ever. 
Join the club, Paul. Uh, such a great story for Peter to end his run on. I like the way all the characters are fleshed out, especially Shara's Jack. Um, the end of the story gets me all the time when the doctor saves Perry at the cost of himself. Definitely showing himself at his noblest. Totally agree with you on that one, Paul. Absolutely. Uh, I also love that we finally got a reason for the stick of celery, which sort of made sense, but didn't. Uh, again, we got a story where you didn't want to lose the actor that played the Doctor. I thought Peter was just hitting a stride as the beloved Time Lord. It was sad to see him go. Uh, once again, love this story. Kindest regards always, Paul. P.S. I hope the other listeners email in, as I would like to hear other people's v- views, not just myself and co-emailer Holly. Yeah. Yeah. So what about that, listeners? You're be- Paul from Australia is calling you out. So step up to the plate, guys. Uh, I'm sure Charles and Jesse would agree. Smiley face, smiley face. PSS, I'm curious which story you are going to review next. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Well, since you asked Paul. Yes, that is perfect timing. Yeah, yes. It's a brilliant, brilliant segue there, Paul. Uh, so next time on Next Stop Everywhere, we're going to talk about, you might think we're going to talk about the ultimate foe, Colin Baker's final story. No, we're not going to talk about that because... Colin Baker himself doesn't isn't really fond of that as his final story because he doesn't regenerate in that story. Um, so we're going to talk about something a little different. We're going to talk about the brink of death. And if you're wondering, okay, the brink of death, what's that? Uh, this is the final story in a big finish audio set called Doctor Who: The Last Adventure, which was a series of four stories uh, featuring a lot of um, the Six Doctors companions. And uh, this is the final story. So um, Colin Baker, this is his officially approved um, exit as the sixth doctor that he recorded, thankfully, before his death, um, which will hopefully not be for a long, long time. And uh, so thankfully he recorded this. And so I'm going to I'm going to post it for Jesse to listen to. And uh, I'm curious about what you think about this, because this is, like I said, this is Colin Baker's, the way he wanted to go out. So I'm looking forward to talking about this with you. Well, and I'm excited because we haven't done a big finish audio in a while. Right. Um, you so know, I thought we, this would kind of change things up a little. I think that's really good. I also think um might be interesting to talk Ginny's crossover story you just mentioned when that finished. Because yeah. we've never talked about Doctor Who comics, so that would be kind of fun. Yeah, that so, would be. Yeah, okay. So, um, but um, but yeah, so if you're looking to kind of follow along with us, you might want to go to bigfinish.com. Uh, you can download the story there. It's Again, it's in the Doctor Who The Last Adventure set. Okay. And it's definitely recommended. And uh, this story that we're going to be covering is the fourth Doctor, fourth story in that four-story set. Nice. So, so four of four, it's called The Brink of Death. Okay, good. That's what we're going to talk about. Do we need to uh, – I mean, obviously it would be fun to listen to the others, but yeah. you don't need to watch – listen to the I don't, others? I don't think so. Okay. I think you I think you could go – I've only listened to this once. Okay. But um, I think you could just – because they are kind of self-contained stories. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, so I'm pretty sure you should be able to um, listen to this. So if there's a problem, we'll figure it out. All but, right, sounds good. But uh, I just thought we'd like to try something a little different. Absolutely. And it also gives Colin his actual regeneration yes. the way he wants to go out. Absolutely. So, uh, so um, since Paul called everybody out and said, hey, we're tired of hearing just of uh, Holly and Paul all the time. Yes. So um, if you want to email us like these two do, uh, thankfully, all the time, uh, next stop everywhere, smg at gmail.com. Or you can reach us on our Twitter account, at NextStopSMG. Or you can drop us a line on our Facebook account, Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. We would love to hear from you. And, uh, and it would be also, we'd also love to, yeah, some of you that are out there that maybe have thought about writing in but haven't, now's your time, I think. Absolutely. You can also leave us a voicemail. Uh, I, we have a Skype number. Uh, we use for um, my Springsteen podcast, and but we also use it for Next Stop Everywhere, 214-736-3121, so we can hear your voice. What we can do is download it, and we'll insert it into the show. 
Uh, we'd love to hear your um, thoughts on um, what's your favorite regeneration. Uh, yeah, yeah. Know. Please let us know what you. Yeah, what's your favorite? What's your top three? Absolutely. Yeah, drop us a line. And let us know. All right. So, uh, Jesse, where can they find you in the meantime on the interwebs? I am at Jesse Jackson DFW on Twitter. I am Jesse Jackson on Facebook. Um, uh, we do. I'm doing set lusting Bruce. I'm continuing. Um, look for in the next few weeks. I was on. I'm going to post the audio from the class discussion on this feed. I was on two Walking Dead panels, Very so cool. we're going to put that on the Biters feed on our network. Uh, a Neil Gaiman discussion that we will probably put on our next stuff everywhere. That was uh, very crowded for an 8:30, um, like Saturday night or something. I mean, it was a packed room. So Neil Gaiman's still pulling him in. Um, awesome. Yeah, and I also have a dis- we did a discussion on um, the colony. And the 100. And so I'm going to put those on Tour de Con. So we've got a little bit of feedback from that way. Um, you weren't at Dragon Con, but you could hear a couple of the panels. Cool. Including Ming from Comic Book Men asking me a question uh, ah. in one of the Walking Dead panels. Yes. He very very cool. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of good. Uh, and Charles, how about yourself? Uh, myself. Oop, sorry about that. The, You're getting uh, ready. Yeah, I know. I'm getting ready. Exactly. So you knew what I was doing. Um, so that uh, obviously I'm at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter machine, uh, at Charles Skaggs on the Instagram, where, again, I posted uh, some photos of my trip to all those various Doctor Who locations uh, in the UK. Um, and then uh, Facebook, of course, at Charles Skaggs. Google Plus for all you crazy kids in the Google Plus. Shout out to and, Karen. Uh, shout out to Karen. And, uh, and then, of course... Damn good coffee and hot. Damn good coffee and hot. Where I talk about next stop everywhere and Doctor Who and all kinds of comic book and sci-fi goodness. Uh, lots of comic book TV news and movie news and uh, anything your little heart desires. So uh, please check out my blog, which just recently passed one million page views. Yay. You know, so, Charles, as we talk... That was very underwhelming. Yay. No, yay. <laughs> what I'm saying... No, I, I was thinking about... Um, it, soon, you and I need to discuss off a mic, probably, yeah. um, a certain TV show that's coming and our plans on how we're going to cover that. Yeah. You I, have been discussing this on the page, and yeah. I am getting like a little kid excited. Like I was, yeah, yeah. I, I, I told Karen, a uh, friend of the show, Karen Lindsay, about that you were kind of like really looking forward to talking about this. Yes. So, so I'm hoping that, yeah, you saw my posts about uh, the show Titans. Yes, yeah, some casting. Um, and so um, we'll have to talk offline. Um, now that I'm out of chemo, maybe we have yeah. a, little, I, a little more energy. Uh, we can talk the plans on that. Yep, sounds good. As everyone knows, Charles and I started our long-term friendship via the Teen Titans. So yeah, this it's, is coming full a, circle. Yeah, yeah, it was in a fan group called Titan Talk, where we were because of the uh, George Pre- Wolf, Marv Wolfman and George Prez's uh, the new Teen Titans, and uh, way back in the day, and uh, we we're fans of those. So obviously, we've got some history with the Titans. And uh, we'd love to talk about that. Yeah, so much good in our life has come because of that fanzine. Come and full so circle. It has come full circle. All right, so continue, right, so, sir. Well, just and also my other two podcasts that I do, uh, the Phantom Zone podcast that I do with Karen Lindsay, the aforementioned Karen Lindsay. Uh, we're finally back on track on that as well, thankfully. We just recorded our uh, episode 114 yesterday, and uh, thankfully. And then um, – Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast they do with Zan Sprouse, uh, where we talk about Twin Peaks, which recently wrapped. Uh, the final episode was while I was overseas, and Zan was kind enough to offer to show it to me via Skype, via her <laughs> computer camera on my little cell phone or whatever. Uh, but uh, I didn't want to watch the finale that way. So, yeah. but and the fact that it was at ten o'clock at night when she like it was airing because of you know time difference or whatever. So. Um, so yeah, I just uh, I appreciate the offer, but uh, I came back home and watched it properly. 
good. Very nice. Yeah, so uh, so please check those out as well. Would definitely appreciate that. And please uh, uh, like us on Facebook and Twitter, and uh, and also on iTunes. We'd love to have another iTunes review. Haven't had one of those in a while. So here on Next Stop Everywhere. Absolutely. All right. So uh, so next time we're going to talk about the brink of death. And uh, Jesse, do you have a quote for us sending us out? I do. The universe is big. It's vast and complicated and ridiculous. And sometimes, very rarely, impossible things just happen and we call them miracles. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you, Charles. It is good to be talking Doctor Who with you again. It is. Welcome back, Jesse. Thank you, sir. I'm glad to uh, have you back. Yeah, me too. Bye, everyone. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.